Welcome to William and Lonsdale, a podcast about the legal ecosystem and the fascinating people who make it tick. Today, your host, Michael Green, speaks with Dan Ma, Professor and Chair of Law at Deakin University. As we'll hear, despite studying law and doing his articles, Dan initially tried fairly hard to avoid a life in the law until he found academia, or perhaps more accurately, until it found him. Dan specialises in constitutional law, lecturing, studying and publishing in the topic all over the world. And in the lead-up to this year's referendum, it is truly enlightening to hear his insights on the proposed Indigenous voice to Parliament. There's an argument against the voice that it will clog the courts with litigation. Do you think that's likely? I think it's highly unlikely, actually, Michael. The second part of the proposed amendment says this body, to be called the voice, may make representations to the federal parliament or the government of the Commonwealth. May means that, that they may offer a view on policies or issues that affect Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders. Most importantly, that provision or that proposed provision is completely silent as to what the parliament or the government do with those representations made. And now that's significant because the proposed amendment places no obligation whatsoever on the government of the day or the Australian Parliament to do anything with the representations made. Of course, the idea is, for those who are proponents of it, is that they will listen to the view offered by The Voice and then make their own judgments about what they do with it. But there's no legal legal or constitutional obligation on the Parliament or the government to do anything. If there's no legal obligation on them, then the chances of there being the flood of litigation which which has been suggested, I think borders on the fanciful, to be honest. Good morning and welcome to Lives in the Law. Our guest this morning is Dan Ma, the Professor in Constitutional Law at Deakin University. Good morning, Dan. Hi, Michael. This morning, Dan, we're going to learn about how an ordinary Geelong kid who was more interested in sport and music and his mates and having a good time came to become a constitutional lawyer and hold a chair in that subject. So let's start at the beginning. Although I said you're an ordinary Geelong kid, in fact, you had a bit of a leg up. Your mum and dad were lawyers. They both. And even more surprisingly, your grandmother was a lawyer. That's right. So tell us about the family. Um, So my dad was a, as you mentioned, Michael, a lawyer. That's why we ended up in Geelong. He studied up at ANU and in order to get some work, to be honest, he moved to Geelong. Uh, He'd just married mum. Mum had actually become a lawyer or graduated before dad. And mum was working uh, in the law office of her mother, my grandmother. Ma, as I used to call her, began a all-female law firm in Williamstown in the, I think it was around the mid-1930s, and it was the first all-female law firm, I understand, in Victoria. And beyond that, at that time, there would have been very, very few female lawyers in Victoria and Australia. I think that's right, and funnily enough, when I uh, spoke to Mum about it, uh, Ma was apparently the, the 13th female admitted in Victoria. Yeah. So, yeah, it was um, quite groundbreaking in many respects. Siblings? You got siblings, lawyers there? Uh, yes. I've got a sister, Susie, who's a couple of years younger than me. She's a lawyer by training, although she never practised. Uh, I've got another brother, a younger brother, Ben, who's not a lawyer, thankfully. He's done something practical. He's a uh, in the building industry. And my youngest brother, who's a lot younger than me, indeed 16 years younger than me, John, uh, he's not a lawyer either. Uh, he's more into um, advertising and marketing. But there's still a strong legal stream in the yeah, family. There, there is. You do your law at Monash. Coming from Geelong, you live in the residential college Mannix. What was life like there, living in a college? Uh, it was great. It was, in, in those days, and maybe it's quite similar now, I ended up at Monash because my HSC mark. Uh, you know, equated to getting into law at Monash. I knew nothing about Monash Law School. Mum and Dad suggested I stay in a college at Mannix. And Mannix is great because there's only, unlike, say, Melbourne Uni, where there's a whole series of colleges, a whole group of colleges, there's really only one at Monash, uh, being Mannix. And so you get a real cross-section of people. And uh, it was wonderful. Great. In fact, probably my closest friends still 
uh, are those that I met and studied with at Monash. So, no, Maddox, Maddox was a great place. We were out, obviously, in Clayton, so you're not right in the thick of it in, in uh, Carlton, so you kind of make your own fun a little bit out there, uh, which we managed to do quite successfully. When I was at university, those who lived in colleges tended to make their own fun for about uh, two and a half of three terms. Right. And then halfway through the third term, it was head down and backside up and study like hell to uh, pass your exams. That's right. Was Mannix the same? Very much so. But in those days, and maybe when you studied law as well, Michael, most of the subjects were year long. Yes. So you actually had you actually had the op- I hesitate to say this, but you had the opportunity to to really enjoy yourself for about six or eight months of the year, and as so long as you uh, realised that you had to work hard for a couple of months, uh, you could do okay. Of course, these days at universities, everything's semester long, um, and the longest unit you'll have is eleven weeks, which it makes it far more difficult for people like myself and maybe others to have um, successfully got through law school and had a good time doing it as well. You're a professor now in constitutional law, so you're really into the black letter law yes. side of law. Yes. Did it immediately interest you when you start university doing the initial subjects? Right. Did it grab you straight away? No, not, not at all. I mean, and this is probably doesn't reflect so well on me, but it was really a matter in those days, my mark, as I said, equated to Monash Law. I went there, obviously I had parents who were lawyers, but I, I really didn't give it much thought. And indeed, in the first couple of years, whilst I got through, I didn't work terribly hard and I wasn't very engaged. It was only really in the last, probably really the last two years, where I did a couple of subjects which I enjoyed. As a consequence, I probably put more work into it and was interested and so did did the reading. And the sort of the penny dropped that there was aspects of it I really did enjoy. But it was really at that, only at that back end of my degree which that occurred. Were there any influential lecturers or professors who grabbed your attention and grabbed your interest and made you see there was something in this which really appealed to you? Yeah. There was one in particular, um, a professor who's uh, still active, a guy called Jeff Goldsworthy. Uh, Jeff taught me uh, constitutional law, and that was probably about third year, I think. And he was quite softly spoken, but very, very intelligent, also very engaging and also empathetic. So he didn't make you feel, he didn't make you aware of what you didn't know. <laughs> he in, instead encouraged you for, on those things that he realised that you did have an interest in. So that was really the first time I had a, uh, a lecturer that I felt really engaged with and the material interested me. And he was a very good lecturer. And it's been very a happy coincidence that with my career, Jeff has been still very instrumental in it. And we remain good friends to, to this day. It wasn't all law and studying law, of course. I remember watching you play a bit of football and you're a good footballer. And you took a break in the middle of your degree to go and play football. That's right. So I <laughs> I'd finished, I did economics as well. So that took three years and I finished that and I was largely disinterested in that. So when I finished economics, I took the year off and I was going to Perth to play football. With an amateur team or or a... No, it was... A waffle team. A a waffle team, yeah. Danny Corcoran, who you probably know, arranged a uh, connection with me at East Fremantle. And so I I and two other friends um, drove over uh, in a combi van enjoyed ourselves as we drove over and I arrived for the first training session of the year and promptly uh, snapped my knee in the first tra- in the first training session. So that was uh, that wasn't the, the, the greatest move of all time. But and was that the end of your football career? Yeah, it was. Yeah, I, I tried to. I had a um, number of operations and I had problems, degenerative knees and so on and so forth, and couldn't quite get right. So yes, it was a. Short and sweet career, Michael. So, so, but what did you do? You've driven to Perth. You've yeah. left Monash behind you. Yes. What, you've wrecked your knee. You've had yeah. uh, medical intervention. Yeah. How long did you hang around for in Perth? Funnily enough, I, I had a very minor procedure so I could walk. I wasn't, prepared, I wasn't quite ready to go home. Um, I probably should have come straight home and got it operated on, but it was at the beginning of a, you know, a, a year-long trip. So I ended up spending about six or eight months, uh, not in Perth, just I was in Perth for a couple of months, did a little bit of work, made some money, and then travelled around the rest of Australia for the remainder of the year. You go back to Monash and finish your law degree, yep. and by that time, courtesy of Jeff Goldsworthy, the law has interested you and does interest you. Yeah. And yeah. so you give it all your attention yep. and work hard at yeah. it. Yeah, the last couple of years I did. 
But didn't do your articles when you finished? No. You didn't get admitted straight away? No, I didn't. No, again, I was sort of a little bit of wanderlust. I wanted to travel overseas. So I um, travelled to the UK in at the end of my degree and spent a year working and travelling and, and seeing the world. Not working in law? Not working in law at all. No, I was a night porter. I used to <laughs> – I worked in a – and strangely enough, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I used to work at night. I worked at a hotel in Drury Lane in London. So I'd have seven days on, sort of four days off and made quite good money for, you know, a, a kid of that age and was able to then travel throughout the UK and through Europe and uh, also over to the States. So, yeah, had a good time. Sounds pretty good. Yes, it was good fun. <laughs> You come back. What about articles? Yeah, did you you got out? You're admitted, so you must must have got articles. Yeah. So and, uh, when I came back, I still and to be honest, I can't exactly remember why I didn't immediately do them. But I my mum was at that point in time involved at the beginning of the Deakin Law School. Deakin Law School got off the ground, I think, in around 1992. And so I'm thinking it's probably about 1994 at this stage, 95. And they had some work, just casual work as a tutor. And so I got home. I had no money. And so I did some tutoring work, just casual work, and quite enjoyed it. Again, it was because it was casual, not a lot of money, but I was living, it was cheap to live down the coast near Geelong at the time, and quite enjoyed it and did it for a year or so. And I got to the end of that year, I thought, okay, I've, I've mucked around enough. It's probably time to do articles and then see what happens. So I did those in around 96, I think. Can I just go back to tutoring? Hmm. I thought as a student a long time ago yeah. that being a tutor was sort of beneath being a lecturer and probably a lot easier, mm. was just a bit of a chat about the subject. Yeah. You say that's not actually correct. Well, no, funnily enough, it, like the, the more I've done of it, I, I find, I mean, I still get nervous before every lecture, but I get far more nervous when I deliver a tutorial or they call them seminars now. And there's something about being in a room around a smallish table or a small group and if the group are informed and engaged, that's a far more taxing form of teaching, I find. Most lectures now are delivered to quite large groups. So in a sense, it's more of a performance and it's a not as much as I'd like engagement, I suppose. So it's a delivery of information. But in a tutorial or a seminar, especially if the students are prepared, I've always found it far more challenging in, in terms of teaching. And in fact, reading through your career, when you, when you first tutored, maybe the uh, students were actually older than you. They were, yeah. With a bit more experience. They, they were. And so the first, it was a real baptism of fire and in hindsight it was a really great introduction to, I suppose, academia. I taught the first uh, couple of years uh, of students who were admitted to the Deakin Law degree. And I don't know why this was the case. It was a small group, around 20 to 25 in the entire year, and they were for the most part uh, experienced in the sense they weren't school leavers. So I presume it must have been a conscious decision by the, the law school when it, when it f first got established. So that, that first group or those first two years, they were really, really smart students mm -hmm. and more experienced than I, uh, both in life and, and in work. So that was a significant challenge. And so it wasn't just a matter of learning the material, but having to learn the material to the extent that I was able to hopefully coherently answer as, as many of the questions. And there were millions of questions. But that was a really good beginning because it made me realise that the, the only way you can teach well is, is, is if you're prepared as well, well as possible. On what I've read, I think maybe the only time you practised law in the traditional sense... Yeah was when you did your articles. Yeah, I did I did my articles at McPherson and Kelly. I then practised for one year after that and I was uh, lucky enough, the, uh, a friend of mine from university was a partner at uh, M&K. He organised the articles. But I was aware that my interests probably didn't align with the firms in the sense that they were predominantly commercial or focused. But they said that uh, we'd like you to do articles and if you can develop a public law, criminal law practice, we would support that. But it's difficult when, you, when you're young and when you, didn't ha when you don't have the connections, I suppose, at that age, it became apparent to me that it was far more difficult or too difficult for me solo to try to develop my own practice in that regard at MNK. They were very supportive, but there were, you know, cost pressures, as you'd, as you'd be well aware, and it became apparent that that just wasn't feasible. So, But also practising law in that manner didn't really engage you. No, it didn't, but I, I suspect it was probably because of the, the material. In the sense, I was it was mainly commercial law focused. I wasn't terribly interested in it, 
I don't. Sus- I, I suspect I wasn't terribly good at it either. And so it was that feeling of insecurity when you're speaking to clients and thinking, I'm a bit of a fraud here. So that made me very uncomfortable. And the firm were supportive and said, you can grow and learn and so on and so forth. But I just didn't have the interest in the material. So at the end of that second year, I suppose, I, I resigned. To be fair to you, Dan, and to all young lawyers, from my experience, everyone ex- has that feeling of being a fraud yeah. and mouthing um, what they think they're meant to mouth yeah. but not really knowing what's behind them. No. Just no, hoping. No, that's right. It's not a very good feeling. And, you know, you realise that there's, these are people and they're, you know, they've got employment and commitments and they've got a legal issue and I'm sitting there and supposed to be the, the font of all wisdom and, and I, I felt far from it. <laughs> so after that first year as an admitted solicitor, Dan, you resigned from McPherson and Kelly. Yeah. What did you do? Well, a friend of mine who I'd been to school with, Michael Luke O'Sullivan, his brothers ran a computer business in Carlton called CSI and they said, look, you can drive the van for us, delivering computers, which I did. And at the same time, uh, a, a bloke that Luke was playing football with at Carlton, his girlfriend at the time worked at a place that sold bottled water, Split Rock. So I took up two jobs, one delivering computers and the other job delivering um, bottled water. So I'm assuming at this stage you're about middle 20s? That's right, yeah. You're admitted solicitor, but you don't want to practice law. Yeah. And so everything in front of you is blue sky. Yeah, in a way. I mean, I was really nervous because I had no money. And as you say, I was mid-20s and I had a few degrees and I was admitted to practice. But I was a little bit unsure. I I really didn't know what I wanted to do. So I was, you know, I was nervous. It wasn't as if I was terribly gung-ho about it, but I uh, had to work and I was living in Melbourne. And so I drove these vans. And funnily enough, whilst I only did it for about six or so months, I thoroughly enjoyed it because it gave me an opportunity. I'd I'd listen to music. Uh, I'd drive around Melbourne. I'd meet people. And uh, I suppose I had, you know, none of the kind of pressures that come with working in a law firm. So I look back on that time quite fondly, funnily enough. You wind up back at Deakin. Yeah. So that was, again, just fortuitous. And that was really, again, due to my mother. Mum at that point was a administrator in the law school at Deakin. And what had happened is that at the end of that year that I was driving the water van, they had a lecturer lined up, an American guy, to come out to teach criminal law. And he literally didn't arrive and he left them in the lurch. And so they were scrambling around desperately to try to get somebody to teach this subject, criminal law. And the dean and my mum were quite closely together and the dean said, would Dan give it a go? He contacted me and said, look, could you... Would you be prepared to teach the, the unit? And I said, well, I'll, I'll give it a go. And so that's how I... And this was on the, the traditional basis of keep a week ahead of the students. Pretty much, Just yeah. Just read, read the book. <laughs> Absolutely. It was very much a week ahead. And it was, it was in those days, Deacon used to teach at night at Burwood. And I was based in Geelong or based in Jan Jack at the time. And so I'd drive to Melbourne and I'd teach, I think, from six to nine the lecture. In in the evening? In the evening. Of course, yeah. And then the following night I'd do four or five tutes and then I'd drive home. So you'd stay in Melbourne that night. That's right, yeah. And then do four or five tutes and then... And head back home. Head back home. That's right. For five days before you started again. That's right. So you've mentioned Jan Jack a couple of times. Am I right in assuming five days of surfing if the (laughs) the wave was good? Well, if if possible, yes. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, in those days Jan Jack was very sleepy. Rents were very cheap. And so we lived quite well. We lived in nice houses on the beach and it was a good lifestyle. I had no commitments um, other than the the one subject I taught. And that was kind of full time because as you say, I was in a sense trying to relearn criminal law, which I'd, which I'd done for five or six years ago. And to try to you know learn it to a level that I could, uh, I suppose, pass as a criminal law lecturer and, and do so in a way that you know was coherent and, and not obvious that I was only just one week ahead, but m- maybe it was. Dan, I come from a a family of teachers, my mother, my wife, my sister, aunts, cousins, and therefore I highly value teaching and teaching skills and and I believe it is a particular skill. It's not something any person can just go and do. Did you have then and do they now provide teacher training to lecturers? It's a really interesting question. When when I started, no, no training at all. Uh, It was literally, in fact, it wasn't even discussed. Um, So when I started tutoring. It was literally the first time I'd ever taught 
was when I first walked into that first class. Same with lecturing. And so, no, until relatively recently, probably in the last decade or so, um, a person is expected to do like a, uh, I think it's called an associate diploma of teaching. But ironically, most people who do the associate diploma, they will have started teaching. They just have to do it. They have to, Mm. in a sense, tick the box. So I'm sure it's probably of some use, but I think you're right. I think you either have a nouse for it or not. You can, of course, get better and you'd hopefully get better the more you do it. But, it's a, yeah, it's a particular skill, I think. And did you look at the good lecturers you'd had and, and think, I'll do what they did, and look at the poor lecturers you had and think, I won't do what they did? Yeah, that's probably right. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. I mean, I tried, to, I tried to teach in as fair a way as possible. I certainly, my style of teaching, and it was maybe a little bit unconscious, but thinking back, it was very much a style which was reflective of what I thought was a good teaching style to me, yes. which was mainly a Socratic method, which is just a fancy word for really engaging with the students, asking questions, getting them to ask me questions and trying to deliver the material in that way. So I always found the, the best way of, the, or the classes I enjoyed the most, I was engaged with. And so I have tried to, I suppose, carry that over in, ter- in terms of the way I teach. Lives in the Law is proudly sponsored by City Maps Illustrated. Their recent publication, The Melbourne Map, is a celebration of our wonderful city. This stunning, hand-drawn illustration, which took more than three years to create, is available as an art print, jigsaw puzzle and calendar. The perfect acquisition for your home, office or corporate gifting. I want to now get to constitutional law, which has been the major part of your career. Why constitutional law? Now, I mean, again, all I can go back to is my own study of it 50-plus years ago. No idea. Read the book. Try and pass the exam. (laughs) And, I mean, and and in the day-to-day life of a lawyer, I guess the constitution affects all of us in, in, but in, you know, when you're working in an office looking after clients' affairs, less than 1% of lawyers have anything to do with the constitution. Absolutely. How come it grabbed you? And um, how did you get a job lecturing in it? Right. So in, in terms of why it grabbed me, I think it's for a couple of reasons. It's a little bit, it's a subject which I think has an, a number of different strands going through it. It's part history, especially in Australia where we have a, a constitution that was written in the 1890s. So it's part historical. Uh, it has that connection with the English common law, which is, you know, over 500, 600 years old. So that interested me, the historical aspect. But it's also about politics. It's about politics and power. And so the political aspect interested me as well. The constitutional law cases, which I found fascinating, were mostly battles between states and the Commonwealth. So in a sense, it sounds quite dry, but it was often about big ticket items, you know, building of dams or or non-building of dams, whether you can say certain things and be prosecuted for defamation laws and so on and so forth. So there was this political aspect to it as well, which I found fascinating. It's also... Part and parcel of constitutional law is about interpretation. So whilst most lawyers, of course, engage interpretation with wills and contracts and the like, in some respects the stakes are a little bit higher with the constitution. So I I find that aspect interesting, this task that lawyers and judges in particular have of trying to read and apply a document that was written in the 1890s to new and uh, unforeseen circumstances. So that I find intellectually quite interesting, but I'm also very respectful of the the challenge it must pose for the judges. So all those strands together, I think, made um, or fired my interest in the the area of constitutional law. So how would you get a job? Again, did it fall into your lap? You've got a very big lap to fall into. (laughs) Yeah, I have been lucky when now I've been in this discussion, Michael, I realise how fortuitous I've been. Again, it was after I'd done that one subject of criminal law, the following, the next year they said, They'd like to keep me on in criminal law. And the constitutional law lecturer resigned and went to another university. So, again, it was a situation of having to plug a hole really at the last minute. And um, for, for better or worse, I thought I was the, the, the person to, <laughs> to plug that hole. So that was, again, just luck. It was being in the right place at the right time. And I taught it for the first time in about 1998 or so. You've made the point that uh, constitutional law, one of the major strands in it is politics. Yeah, is it therefore appropriate to teach it in a political fashion? Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question and controversial in our sort of, in my field. I don't think it is. I, I try so far as possible 
to deliver the materials in a way which allows the students themselves, who are intelligent and engaged mostly, to form their own views. And sometimes that's difficult because some of the high court cases can deal with very, very difficult, sometimes moral issues. So the areas of migration law can be raise those sorts of thorny issues. But I have tried to teach it in a way which the students are not aware of my own political views. Um, They could probably guess, I'm sure, but I I want them to... I think it's important, one, for... One, it's law, and there is, whilst there's an overlap sometimes in constitutional between law and politics, it's still law, it's not politics. And so I see my duty is to try to teach the law of the constitution as well and as value-free as possible to the students, but being cognizant of the fact that they're, they're intelligent, often young people, who will be forming their own views and I want to give them the space and the intellectual freedom to do so. So there are certainly lecturers who would teach constitutional law, I think, in far more political fashion, if I might say so. And that I I find problematic because it's often the case that the, the politics is a more progressive politics rather than a conservative politics. And I, I don't see that as part of my role in terms of teaching the law of the Constitution. And I want the students to form their own views, which they do. You said it uh, might lead to a progressive outlook or I guess a, um, a more left-wing outlook on yeah. politics, if, yep. depending how it's taught. But you've also said that it's led to you being legally conservative. Yeah. What do you mean by that? So I have a reasonably firm idea of the, the role of law and the, the role of politics. I have very strong views, like everybody else, about um, views of politics and moral issues, but I don't see the, in most cases, I don't see the role of judges to try to further a particular political or moral point of view through their in- interpretation or their judgments. Uh, I see that as a role for parliament. And so I, I have a probably a, quite a traditional or orthodox view of law And I think it's important that the distinction so far as possible between law and politics is maintained. And that also, I think, is energising for the democratic sphere as well, that when there is or when there are important moral issues, say like same-sex marriage, that those things are dealt with and engaged with through the Australian public and then through our democratic institutions, rather than having a high court or a court decide those issues for us. So that's what I mean. I don't. I think law is a distinct body of knowledge and, and a discipline and a profession. And I think it's important that, that that distinction, so far as possible, between law and politics is maintained. Does that mean that in interpretation, judges should be trying to be true to what Parliament intended rather than what they may think is appropriate. Yeah, absolutely. Is that, is that I got, Ab- I got that no, right? Absolutely. The, I mean, people disagree about this, but my own view is that statutes or legislation are, dem- are enacted by a democratically elected Parliament. They enact legislation for a particular purpose or purposes, and the job of the judge so far as possible is to facilitate that purpose. And, of course, judges will be faced with situations, especially in the higher courts, probably quite regularly, where they might disagree with the policy of, a leg- of the legislation. But their role is to give or is to further that and allow in the democratic sphere, but if there's going to be changes to it, um, that that is done in a democratic fashion. And I, I think that's important for our politics. I think it's important respect for democracy, for Australian people. But of course, judges, especially in the senior appellate courts, would face very difficult questions in that regard. And sometimes law does run out as well, so something has to guide them. But so far as possible, I think that's absolutely right, that they their job is to further the goal or the purpose or the intention, as you've said, of legislation and give effect to it. So, Dan, you've now been at Deakin for a few years on and off. Yep. But you've been casual. That's right. You haven't, there's been no permanency to your position. Yep. A, how did it become permanent? And B, have you got a family by now? Are you married? You've got kids? Are you earning enough to survive on? I mean, I've always assumed that junior academics don't get paid much. No, they don't. Um, so it was a, after I'd done the, the first year of constitutional law, Michael, 
the next year, so it was probably around 99, 2000, they offered me a permanent position. But you're right, at, at the lowest level and it didn't pay a lot. But we we're pretty lucky in those days, especially, say, in the Geelong area. You know, the sort of cost of living pressures that are bearing down on people now just didn't exist. So I didn't make a lot of money, but I didn't need a lot of money to survive. I wasn't married at that point in time. So I think I probably uh, had my first permanent position around 19, 1999, 2000. I ended up getting married three, about three or four years later. And we had a, a son in 2002. So, no, I had the son first and then the marriage later, which have, of course, um, raised their eyebrows in my particular family. <laughs> so you've got a permanent position. Yeah. But surely plain LLB, even if you had honours, isn't enough to be a permanent academic. No, no. So straight away, as soon as I got the, when I was offered the permanent position, these days you would never get a permanent position in academia in any law school unless you had postgraduate degrees. So I, again, I was lucky in that regard. Um, but as soon as I was offered the permanent position, I was told that to continue on, I had to study, do postgraduate study. In those days, there wasn't so much of an obsession with PhDs, so I began a master's degree and did that for part-time for a a year or two, and so that that got me on my way. But a PhD followed? That's right. So by the end of the time when I completed my master's, law schools, mainly in Australia, not so much overseas, uh, started to really expect the younger lecturers to either have or have begun a PhD. So I completed my master's after a couple of years and was told that, was encouraged in adverted commas, that it would be useful for my career to begin a PhD, which is, at the time, was quite daunting. What was your thesis? What was the topic of your thesis for your PhD? The topic was the constitutional validity of racial vilification laws, question mark, I suppose. So I was interested in freedom of speech issues. And around that time, so I'm talking uh, sort of early 2000s, it was the first raft of what I suppose you'd call hate speech or racial vilification laws were enacted in uh, a handful of Australian jurisdictions. So, yeah, that was my thesis. Sometimes theses are published and can stimulate debate in the general community or the political community. Did your PhD thesis have some wider application than just qualifying you? I suppose only in the sense that it was the thesis decided or argued that the laws were constitutional, but then moved in the in the second half of the thesis to be a more evaluative analysis, i.e. are they a good idea or not? Do they work or not? And that was a little bit uncomfortable territory for me because I wasn't a practising lawyer. So I spoke to a lot of barristers here and lawyers on the ground and also police officers. And their view were that criminal racial vilification laws centre an important symbolic symbol, but were very practically difficult to prosecute. So they were usually ordinary type of criminal offences, assaults and the like, but then you had to prove, prove an intent of that the act was done to with a, raci- a racist motive. My thesis basically said they're a good idea for symbolic reasons, but were practically difficult to enforce. As to whether it had a wider application, I probably it informed some debate, but really probably within legal communities and parliamentary. So I don't think my thesis had any direct effect on the shape of the laws, but maybe some uh, in legal and policy circles as to their usefulness or not. You use the word symbolic. Can you see value, and this could be currently topical, of course, Yeah. in symbolic laws? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's interesting. When I think there seems to be a presumption that when you say it is symbolic, that is, it is somehow less than whole or, or tokenistic. And no, I don't think that uh, is the case. So, yeah, I do believe that, say, in the area of racial vilification laws, the measure of their success or otherwise is not just how many prosecutions you have. And it's important symbolically because you're saying to often vulnerable minorities, racial and religious and otherwise, that you're valued and that certain conduct is beyond the pale and is unlawful. So even if there is no, even if there's limited practical enforcement of those laws, the fact that they're on the statute book themselves, in my view, is an important statement to the community, to the courts, to police officers, that these are important, these people matter, and we are not going to tolerate as a society certain conduct directed towards their abuse or otherwise. So yes, I do think there is a role for, of course, it's a, you'd hope that, it's, that the laws may be more than just symbolic, but the symbolic role of, say, racial vilification laws, I think, is a really important one. 
Another part of being an academic is publishing papers. Yes. And I understand that's an, an ongoing thing. Yep. You must continue to publish. Yes. How, well, back then when you started as a young academic, yeah. how did you deal with that? So that was that was quite frightening because all of a sudden you're, you're and it's still frightening in the sense that part and parcel of your career or your success or otherwise of your career is getting things published. So I did it in two ways. When I did my master's, the assessment tasks were usually writing a 10,000-word paper. So that gave me the opportunity to try to refine those assessment tasks and try to get them published. And I was lucky. I got a couple published reasonably early on. And I quite enjoyed the process. It's, it's still quite harrow- well, harrowing. Well, harrowing is probably a little bit dramatic, but it's it's quite a lonely process. And you you write something, you research it, and you send it out, and for people to criticise. And that's still the case now. And we all but, got an ego about criticism. No, that's right. And so I thought I would, as I got older, that it'd get easier. But funnily enough, I think I've got more thin-skinned as I've got older. I don't. <laughs> I used to be able to take criticism more twenty years ago than now. So I, I chose to, even with my thesis, my PhD thesis, I sort of relied reluctantly started it a bit for career reasons, but my supervisor, a guy called George Williams, suggested, look, treat the thesis as a group of articles, connected articles. That way it becomes manageable and also you might then have the opportunity to publish those chapters in modified form as articles. So that's what I did. And that got that got me going. So I was able to publish some things, get some runs on the board and get some experience as to how the process worked. And publishing goes on. Yeah. And there's Melbourne University Press, and I guess all the universities have a press, and they're the sort of places in which you publish. Yeah, there's a range of law journals in Australia. But also, thankfully, with being a common law jurisdiction, I can publish and do publish overseas in the United States and the UK and indeed in New Zealand as well. And books, so you can provide chapters in books or books themselves. So Speaking about egos and fragile egos, <laughs> what about rejection? I mean, so we all read about authors, yeah. of fiction particularly, I guess, who who write and uh, put out their book to 20 publishers and get knocked back and occasionally they get one and it turns out to be a hit or something. But do you face rejection with, you know, might you put up a a manuscript and be told, no, we think there's nothing in this? Regularly, unfortunately. (laughs) (laughs) More often than not, unfortunately, Michael. Yeah, it's it's still the hardest part of the job because you are researching something, it takes some time, and things we write, say, for a journal article will run between, say, eight and 15,000 words, and then you send it out to a journal. And in Australia, it's quite different. You can only send the article to one journal. In the United States, you can send it, the article to as many journals as you like, and it becomes like a competitive thing. Here, you must wait on the decision of the, the single journal that you've sent it to, and often it's unfavourable. Very rarely do, do you get an acceptance with no changes. The best results I tend to get are what you might call a provisional acceptance, i.e. it's all right but it's fundamentally flawed and needs to be rewritten significantly. And then sometimes, more often than not, um, it'll be rejected and so the process starts again. Who are the people making that decision? Now, the general publishing world with fiction or non-fiction, you've got editors who are experienced people and probably know more about writing maybe than the author. But in the legal world... Who's got the right to tell you, a professor, that you got it wrong? Well, I'd like to say they haven't, but unfortunately they do. <laughs> but who are they? <laughs> who are they? So basically people like me. What will happen is that the journal, oh, sorry, the article will be sent to the journal. The journal will then contact people that they consider, so other legal academics uh, who are experts in the area, and they, if they agree to review the article and it'll be reviewed by two or three, they will then provide a report or a review anonymously. So in, in an ideal world, it's going to peers who are similarly, hopefully expert in the subject matter that you've written the, the article on. But sometimes it's, you know, it's not a perfect world. Sometimes I will get reviews that are very, very good and constructive and other times maybe not so. <laughs> So, Dan, you do your PhD and while doing your PhD and subsequently you're publishing on freedom of speech, hate speech, for about 10 years. Yeah. Then you become interested in something called the principle of legality and you publish in this area. I've been in the law for 50 plus years and I'd never heard that phrase, the (laughs) principle of legality, before reading your background. What is it? Well, it's a fancy new phrase, Michael, for a technique of statutory interpretation that judges... Uh, both in Australia and the United Kingdom, have done for literally centuries. And it's a technique 
which at its most fundamental level interprets statutes in a way that to try to protect fundamental rights or freedoms. Judges have always done it. For a long time, they did so, for example, to protect interests which they considered to be paramount, and those interests usually were property rights. Uh, And so that's why we had for a long time in both the UK and Australia, um, judges interpret tax statutes narrowly. The idea that it was proper to try to protect the property rights of the citizen. And one way of doing that was to read these tax statutes narrowly. So the the phrase, the principle of legality, has only been around for about 20 years or so. It's a snappy new phrase and sounds very loyally and very um, uh, high sounding. But it's, it's really a it's a description or a phrase for a technique that's been used for a long time by judges. Did they use it to expand beyond protecting property rights to protecting other rights? Interestingly, the uh, around probably the mid-70s or so, our High Court uh, used this technique to read tax statutes narrowly and copped quite significant flack for doing so, both from the political arms of government but other sectors of society. So interestingly, it's sort of the, the technique, this interpretive technique, fell away, wasn't used so much. But then I suppose around the mid to late 80s, our courts started to use that technique again, but to protect a whole new range of fundamental rights or freedoms, maybe more progressive human rights type interests like freedom of speech, court access, religion and so on and so forth. To my recollection, this is showing me to be uh, my limited knowledge of the law, those rights aren't mentioned in our constitution? No, they're not. And, and that's an important point. These rights in Australia, uh, what I'm calling rights, known as common law rights, common law f- fundamental freedoms. So they are rights or freedoms or interests that the judges themselves have developed in case law over time. And why it's important is that, as you mentioned, they're not mentioned in the Australian constitution. So they are court or judge-generated rights and freedoms, and it's through the technique of statutory interpretation that those rights and freedoms are protected. But of course, as common law rights and freedoms, they remain susceptible to to um, abrogation or um, diminution by, by parliament, by statutes. We don't have those rights in our constitution. There was debate I forget how long ago, I'm going to roughly say 20 years ago, quite significant public debate about us having a Bill of Rights which set out right. fundamental rights. Yes. It never got off the ground. Are you in favour of us having a Bill of Rights or not having a Bill of Rights? And maybe compare it, I guess, to the American situation where they do have a Bill of Rights, don't they? They do, yeah. So there's probably there's two models. There's the American model where their Bill of Rights is part of their higher law constitution. There was a move, or there's been various times where there's been attempts to try to do something similar in Australia, uh, but you're right, they've they've failed. Personally, no, I'm not a favour of an entrenched higher law American style Bill of Rights. In brief, the reason for that is that ultimately it leaves to the decision of our highest court, decisions on issues which are really deeply and fundamentally moral and political decisions, which I'm not necessarily sure it's wise to have a group of very smart lawyers, but non-elected judges nonetheless, making those decisions ultimately for us, as this is the case in the United States. And for example, in Australia, we have um, same-sex marriages legalised, but that was a a consequence of the federal parliament doing so. And it's not in our constitution. It's not in our constitution, no. And by way of contrast, in the United States, it was the American Supreme Court who decided that their parliaments or their congresses must recognise same-sex marriage. And I think the the difficulty I have with it or the, the, the discomfort I have with it is that ultimately I think people, they might disagree with a decision by parliament, but it's been made by a demo, through a democratic process. Whereas a, having a final court of appeal, like the High Court or the American Supreme Court decide those issues... I think people who are on the losing side are less, are less accepting of that. And so personally, I'm not a favour of a constitutional Bill of Rights. We do have, though, the, there are, is an alternative model, what's known as a statutory Bill of Rights. So, for example, in Victoria, we have the Victorian Charter of Human Rights. There's an equivalent in the United Kingdom. Uh, there's also one in ACT in Queensland. That sets out very similar kinds of rights that are in the American Bill of Rights, but it's in, in an ordinary statute. So what it's saying is to the parliaments, we want you to legislate in a way that is furthers or protects these rights, 
but at the end of the day, they can override them. It's up to Parliament. So I suppose in simple terms, a statutory bill of rights leaves the parliaments themselves to determine finally these questions, not the courts. And in my view, that, that strikes the right balance. William and Lonsdale is brought to you by Greens List, one of the leading multidisciplinary barristers' lists in Australia. Greens List believe in promoting conversation around the ideas and issues that shape not only our legal system, but our wider community. We as outsiders may think that one of the perks of being an academic is the opportunity to travel and work overseas. And you'd, and you'd be right. <laughs> <laughs> it is a perk, isn't it? I thought it might have some substantial benefit yeah. in uh, opening up your mind, um, exposing you to different people and different uh, ways of thinking and working yeah, and yeah. Uh, different legal systems. You've done a lot of that. Yes, I have. Tell us a bit about it. Where have you been? What have you done? And what have, the, what have you learnt from being in these places and being exposed to these different systems? So one of the real joys of academia is being able to spend time either interstate or overseas at a different institution and undertaking research. So in academia, we call them sabbaticals. And the first time I became eligible for one, so to become eligible, it's really just you serve three years in the one law school. Can I please uh, draw attention to the fact sabbatical means once every seven years? <laughs> well, thankfully not in my law school, Michael. That's why every. <laughs> I think any Latin scholar would agree with me. Yeah, there, Dan. Yeah. Well, you, you're right. That's right. <laughs> so the first time I got the opportunity, I'd, I'd spoken to colleagues at other universities in the constitutional law field, and they encouraged me that you must go overseas. And I remember thinking, I will, I will. I, I didn't need much encouragement, and. Uh, a guy who's now passed at University of New South Wales, George Winterton, said, you really, really must go overseas and remove yourself from your usual workplace and your usual commitments. You'll find it really, really worthwhile and valuable and you will probably write some good things. And I remember at the time thinking, I'm more than happy to take him up on that offer, the opportunity to go overseas. But it did work that way. Uh, once you get to a different place, being in different geographical environment, surrounded by different things, different people, not having ordinary work commitments and family commitments, things do change. You, you do think different thoughts and you're freed up, I suppose, in some way from the ordinary day-to-day -day life. And I was surprised to find out that, yes, it was really, really beneficial and beneficial for research and just meeting different people as well. So, yes, it's a, it, it is a perk in the sense that it's a really nice thing to be able to do, to have the opportunity to go and live somewhere different and work and, and research, but it's, yeah, really, really valuable. Has it only been in common law jurisdictions or have you been in a European university, where law school, where, of course, it's not a common law jurisdiction? My, own, my personal ones have only been in common law jurisdictions, but that's been mainly to do with going to places where there were people who were experts, real experts in the area that I was researching in. There's no reason, and plenty of my colleagues will travel to European, so for example, an expert in international law, makes good sense that they go to Germany or other European institutions. In my own life, it's been, or my own experiences have been common law jurisdictions. So I call, the Americans sort of don't consider themselves now common law jurisdiction, but in a sense, they were, they were founded by the common law. Why don't they consider, I mean, I thought they're like us, they're bound by the doctrine of precedent. Yeah, they are. So, but with the American Revolution and the ejecting of the British, the enacting of their Declaration of Independence and the creation of the United States Constitution, in a sense, it was considered legally almost like a clean slate. But interestingly, of course, it can't be a clean slate and they passed laws saying that so far as possible, aspects of the English common law will continue until we decide to change it. In being exposed to these different universities, in my recollection, the US, UK, New Zealand, South Africa, That's right, yeah. how do our law schools stand up against the law schools in other places? Really, really well. In Australia, there are universities and law schools that have far more resources than others, and they tend to be the, the old sandstone universities. And so those law schools are far bigger and far better resourced. So, but in terms of our students and in terms of the quality of the, the academics, surprisingly well. Uh, when I say surprisingly well, what I mean is that in the United States, for example, the, their better law schools are really big 
extraordinarily well-resourced institutions. And they produce brilliant students and they have brilliant academics. But the more I've travelled and the more I've engaged with their student body and also with their, their academics, I realise that you know, we're, we're punching in the same sort of division as them. So we'll leave the perks and the overseas travel and get back to the daily life of an academic. You've got to balance. I mean, as a professor, do you do much teaching? That's all dependent, and this is relatively recent, Michael, but in terms of the amount of teaching you do now, it's quite formulaic and really boils down to the more you publish and the the so-called better places you publish in, the less teaching you do. So it really turns on on a year-to-year basis. If I publish quite a lot, I do less teaching. I always teach a course in constitutional law, but that division of labour, I suppose, is dependent largely upon how much you publish. Your director of research at Deakin Law School, Yep. what does that entail? I mean, I, it's, I'm assuming you're supervising other people who are doing research. And how so, much of your time does that take up? Yeah, so I'm, in terms of time-wise, it's probably maybe half a day, sometimes a day a week. It's a, it's a variety of different roles. It's part administrative and part sort of academic. The administrative side of things... The university gives every school an amount of money to support research-related activities. So, for example, if somebody wants to go to a conference, they make an application, the application comes to me for a certain amount of money and I approve it or just um, reject it. So that's the administrative side of things. Maybe the um, more important academic side of things, as I see it, is trying to foster a research culture in the school. So we do that by, well, I try to do it by two, in two ways. The first is that we have a law school seminar program. So every fortnight we have a a speaker, mostly from within the law school, to discuss and debate a work in progress. And so I got that off the ground when I first became the director of research. And that's a really important thing because it allows people to come together. We We have a meal. Student, not students, just no, just academics, staff, yeah. just staff, yeah. yeah. And um, other people from law schools are most welcome to join us as well. And of course, now with the ubiquitous Zoom, they can do so remotely. So that part of the the role I consider really important because it's fostering a research culture, allowing people the opportunity to discuss their work in progress, get feedback in a constructive forum, especially for the young, for the younger members of our staff. So my role there, I I see, is a mentor's too strong, but trying to foster a culture, especially with the young or new new members of staff, to give them the opportunity and the support to undertake research and get things published to get their careers going as well. Let's bring ourselves right up to the moment and a political issue, the biggest political issue in Australia at the moment, Dan, is the forthcoming referendum on the voice to Parliament for Indigenous people. Yeah. There's an argument against the voice that it will clog the courts with litigation. Do you think that's likely? I think it's highly unlikely, actually, Michael. The proposed amendment states that the, the voice, the body to be established called the voice, may make representations. Can I just clarify the yeah, point there? Because sure. I, I think I'd be guilty like most people yeah. of not thinking of the voice as a body, an yeah. actual institution. Yes. You, think, you think it in terms of some ephemeral thing like as a voice. Right. But in fact, it is a constituted body. That's right. With, is it nine people on it? Well, they haven't determined that yet. So the the proposed wording in the first subsection says there shall be a body called the voice. In terms of its composition, and in terms of its functions and powers, that will be, if it's if the referendum successful, will be determined by the parliament through legislation. But there are certain design principles that are on the table now and which the Albanese government have supported or have said they have support. So the idea would be that the, the voice would be comprised of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders from each state and territory and from each geographic aspect of that state and territory. So that still it remains not, not an unknown, but its pre- precise composition will not be determined until by the parliament. So, yes, it is a institution. And maybe importantly as well, it's a constitutional institution. And what I mean by that is that it's, in a sense, like the High Court or the House of Representatives, it's a body that is established by the Australian Constitution. It will require legislation by the parliament to establish it, to get it going, but it's a constitutional institution. The second part of the proposed amendment says this body, to be called the voice, may make representations to the federal parliament or the government of the Commonwealth. Now, 
as most lawyers would remember, maybe in their first week of law school, you do a little bit of statutory interpretation and one of the words that looms large is often may, may or shall. May means that, that they may offer a view on policies or issues that affect Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders. Most importantly, that provision or that proposed provision is completely silent as to what the parliament or the government do with those representations made. And that's significant because the proposed amendment places no obligation whatsoever on the government of the day or the Australian parliament to do anything with the representations made. Of course, the idea is, for those who are proponents of it, is that they will listen to the view offered by the voice and then make the, their own judgments about what they do with it. But there's no legal, obli- no legal or constitutional obligation on the parliament or the government to do anything. If there's no legal obligation on them, then the chances of there being the flood of litigation which has been, which has been suggested, I think borders on the fanciful, to be honest. And you'd be agreeing with it. I think the former High Court Justice Ken Hain has said the same, I think, and uh, former Chief Justice Gleeson, I think, has said the same also. So uh... There will be litigation, of course. People will litigate. But the litigation, if it's in the form of trying to force the government to take on the view of the voice or the representation offered, there simply doesn't seem to be a hook for that litigation to be successful. Mm. But, of course, you can't stop people litigating and neither should we. What about the suggestion that every piece of legislation is potentially will have an effect upon Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and therefore everything, be it a piece of tax legislation, whatever, may generate a recommendation from the voice? Yeah, so that's a really interesting point because the proposed amendment very much leaves it the ball in the, the voice's court as to what issues or policies they make representations about. So does that in theory mean they could make a representation on any proposed legislation? The answer is yes. But we've got to th- think about the, the institution itself. It will be have a limited number of people, a limited amount of funding and resources, and also maybe the most important thing is they want to use their political capital wi- wisely. So, a, for example, a if the voice did do that and made representations on completely unrelated policies or proposed laws, their political capital is depleted quite quickly. So I think it just it would defy common sense for the voice, a particular voice, to do that. Of course, if it does happen, then those persons who com- comprise that particular voice could, of course, be replaced or the institution refined. So it relies on the goodwill and good faith and good sense of the institution itself and I suppose the the understanding that to make frivolous or completely irrelevant claims to Aboriginal or representations to Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders would quickly diminish their own political capital. So I consider that probably unlikely. One of the other potentially controversial parts of the uh, proposal, as I understand it, is the use of the phrase executive government. I'm not clear what that means. Could you give us your expert opinion on what it means yes. and is it likely to be something which creates a problem? So the executive government, I suppose, is the administrative side of government. The head of our executive government formally, in fact, is the, the King of Australia, but the top of our executive government in Australia is the Governor-General, then it's all the government departments, so what we call the public service. So there is some angst in some quarters that does that mean the voice is going to be sending memos to public servants in Canberra constantly? And in that way, um, I suppose, hamper the machinery of government. Again, I think it's highly unlikely. We don't necessarily know yet how the representations will be fed into the political and legislative process. But you could, you could probably understand that most likely what will happen is that the representation would be made to, say, the responsible minister on a particular policy or the, the secretary of the particular government department. So there will be a mechanism that parliament themselves choose to ensure that the representations made do reach the relevant government department. So that's what we mean by the government, the executive government of the Commonwealth. Do I think it's going to be problematic? No, I don't. And indeed, it is the role, properly so in my view, for parliament to determine what the used or to what use the representations made by the voice will be put. So parliament might say the executive government or the government department must listen or at least acknowledge the representation, but what they do what they do with that 
will be up to the relevant minister. So it's Parliament that will ultimately have the final call as to what the the use to which these representations will be made. And am I right in assuming that in making representations to a relevant minister or department, they would be one of only many bodies who are interested in a particular piece of legislation or prospective piece of legislation to make representations? Right. Yeah, I mean, It'll be a typical thing happening in government all the time. Absolutely. It's a really, really good point. And maybe it's not a point that has been emphasised enough by proponents of the voice. The notion that a, a, pers- a, a body, a representative body, would provide some input to a process about a law or a policy that affects them happens the whole time. It is an absolute commonplace part of government and a good p- part of government. Mm. So what's different, of course, is that it, it is a constitutional body, but the process itself is something that good governments happen the whole time. A proposed tax is is flagged, the Business Council of Australia and other representative bodies. Will trade make, unions. Right. Trade unions will make representations and appropriately so. Mm. But ultimately, it will be the political arms of government, parliament and the executive government that decide or make the final decisions and so to what effect that they give, if any, to those particular representations made. Dan, thank you for coming in this morning. It's been absolutely enlightening to me to hear you tell us about your career and about constitutional law. If you'd been my lecturer 55 years ago, I would have been a far better lawyer, (laughs) I am sure, (laughs) and would have known far more about our constitution and its application to our daily life. It's been really interesting and I've loved it. Thanks for coming in. Thanks very much, Michael. I I too have had a great time. Show notes from today's episode can be found at greenslist.com.au forward slash podcast. There you'll find links to things we've talked about in this episode, a transcript of the show and some wonderful photos of our guests. If you're enjoying Lives in the Law, please tell your networks, subscribe, rate and review the show. Your host is former lawyer and Greenslist clerk, Michael Green. Our show is produced and edited by me, Catherine Green, mixed and mastered by Windmill Audio, and recorded by Alex McFarlane, who also wrote and performed all the music for the series. We're coming to you from the iconic Owen Dixon Chambers on the corner of William and Lonsdale Streets in our beautiful city of Melbourne. We acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional custodians of this land and pay our respect to their elders past and present. There is no doubt that conversations about justice have been taking place on this land for thousands of years, and we are privileged to continue that discussion here today.